It's been a few weeks now since we've arrived back in Pennsylvania and it hasn't seemed to stop snowing since we got here. Come along with me as I share the experiences and memories that will last a lifetime and reflect on all of the things that I learned on this trip. As the holidays passed and anticipation grew about this trip, so did my fears and worries. What if I got COVID while in country? What if I got separated from the group? What if I got hit in the head by a falling coconut? Despite all of these nagging thoughts in the back of my mind, I was excited to travel and to learn about a different culture while actually being surrounded by it, rather than just sitting in a classroom learning about it. I was excited to learn from local Barbadians and live and be present in every possible moment. I decided that the benefits far outweighed the consequences, and I was not going to let another study abroad opportunity slip through my fingers. Our first morning in Barbados almost felt like a dream. The feeling of the sun on my skin while looking over the Atlantic Ocean immediately reassured me that I had made the right decision. The walk to Concept Bay was our first interaction with Tony, and I knew then that we would learn a lot from this man and that two weeks simply wouldn't be enough. I was baffled by Tony's ability to recognize plants and spout out tons of valuable information on the spot. We had two children tag along on our hike. Their knowledge of a local flora nearly matched Tony's, and I was astonished by their manners and instinct to trust our group, a bunch of people that were just complete strangers to them. While visiting Hunts Gardens after our morning hike, we were surrounded by a maze of green. The sound of the wind in the plant leaves and the live music contributed to the overall experience and brought a sense of peace and calmness to me after a long two days of traveling and going nonstop. On the second day, we visited the Andromeda Botanical Gardens, where we learned about plant evolution from Dr. Moose. He introduced a new and interesting perspective to me, and that's that some plants can be related but different because of their environment, and some plants can be unrelated but similar because of their environment. My favorite parts about Andromeda, aside from Dr. Moose almost getting conked in the head with a coconut, was the massive bearded fig tree and the palm tree grove, where there were palm trees of all shapes and sizes. That afternoon, we traveled to Bottom Bay, the first official beach go of our trip. The beach was beautiful with turquoise water and the rhythmic sound of the rough waves constantly crashing onto the beach. When we arrived, we noticed a few men selling coconut drinks and most of us bought one. These men selling the drinks warned us that it was going to rain in about 20 minutes and they were spot on. It was wild to me how in tune with nature and the weather patterns they were. When the rain did come, we all took cover in an open cave along the beach where we watched the ocean grow wild and then calm again. On day three, we visited the Newton Slave Burial Ground, where we learned about the history of the site from Mr. Kevin Farmer. Let's have a listen. From Boston to King Brown. Um, those newly freed, there's a, how should I put it? There's a great restriction on their ability to either own or access land. Uh, what is introduced here through the Masters and Servants Act is quite similar to the sharecropping system that happened in the South. Um, after the end of slavery in 1865. Um, and that is about restricting access to land so that you can actually control labor. Uh, Masters and Servants are also, in a way, sought to restrict movement off island. Um, you had to get a license, literally, to move off island. Uh, many people, three people, did what they would have done during the statement. 
and they left. Um, some never to return. Others, um, if they were lucky enough to have made some money to remit and to buy property. Uh, especially After leaving Newton and enjoying a delicious lunch from Uncle Joe's, we headed up north to the St. Nicholas Abbey Distillery. Here, we learned about the history of the island's smallest rum operation and got our first taste of Barbadian rum. During our tour, the guide mentioned the role of slave labor in the history of the distillery, which was a pretty big deal according to Mr. Farmer. He explained that many tourist attractions are faced with the challenge of representing the role and history of slavery while not making the experience too history-based and scaring tourists away. This felt like an injustice to all of the people who played a, such a significant role in the history of the island. In Gettysburg, where I'm from, slavery history and the battle against slavery are the reason thousands of people visit each year, and so it was eye-opening to see the complete opposite in another country. <laughs> He he's, care. He's, gonna <laughs> bite, he's gonna bite you. No, he's, gonna bite bite you. He's, he's just checking. On day four, we got to see this roadside coconut water operation. They would collect coconuts from a tree, cut them open one by one, and then dump them into half gallon jugs and move on to the next. While watching intently from the bus, I realized that this is an interesting cultural difference between Barbados and the US, where approvals and licenses surely would be required for this sort of thing, but here they were just selling jugs alongside the road. After this pit stop, we traveled to the Barbados Military Cemetery, where Tony was waiting for us. So I've been replaced at some stage by a drink from the bark of a tree. Um, but that tree, that tree's not found on Barbados. Okay. <laughs> So the mystery <laughs> Listen carefully to the next clip for Dr. Moose's feelings about animals. Every good botany lecture is ruined by, ruined by squirrel or stupid animals. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Hi buddy. Oh, I'm sorry. Come on. After visiting the cemetery, we ate lunch at a local roti place. Let's check in with Cuppy to see how he felt about his meal. Tell me how you felt about that. My nose is running <laughs> and I cannot feel my mouth. That is enough. <laughs> Tony joined us again at the massive baobab tree. One thing we learned about here was the navel string. Similar to the way we refer to going back to our roots in the US, the navel string is a cultural practice in Barbados where parents of newborns would bury the umbilical cord in a place that they considered home. As a result, many Bayesians refer to their home or community as their navel string. While listening to Tony talk, I thought about how many cultural practices around the world are different but are rooted in the same concepts and ideas. After searching all week for a good mahogany seed pod, we finally found one. Yeah, yeah. like Wow, this is crazy. This is the strongest mahogany yet. Wow. Oh. On day five, we followed Coach Radio's lead on the Bath to Bathsheba hike. Take a moment in the next few videos to listen to the sounds of the Atlantic against the coral rocks, imagine the ocean breeze, and admire the breathtaking views. If you do it right, it'll almost feel like you're there. That is so cool. Oh, he's in there. Hey, buddy. Don't fall. Don't, don't. Oh, my axe. 
Our first trip to Oyston's was certainly something, to say the least. The constant aroma of fried fish, the shouting from restaurant staff encouraging you to eat at their establishment, and the massive amount of people chattering and drinking banks definitely reflected the Friday night culture in Barbados. On day six, we met Mr. Trevor Marshall and learned about the history of Bridgetown. 1887, and this is how ships were repaired. They were, remember they had wooden hulls and wooden sides, etc., and they were repaired at that time that way. showcase of the work of local artists, from food and paintings to jewelry and clothing. It reminded me of a more relaxed version of the Adams County Apple Harvest Festival or May Fest in Huntington, but it happens every weekend rather than just once a year. After Holder's Hill, we visited Sister Irika's shrine for her daughter, where we learned about a typical service at the shrine and drank bush tea. Visiting the shrine, we trekked through Turner's Hall Gully, where I took time to reflect, to think, and to observe. I noticed the way the one plant parasite inhabited a macaw palm leaf and was amazed by the macaw's ability to protect itself so well, but still fall victim to a tiny little worm. I noted the way Barbadians are so in touch with nature and their surroundings, which reflected in the Codrington kids from day one. I considered the Bayesian lifestyle and compared it to the way of living in U.S. Are Barbadians lazy or are we too busy constantly running and making progress? I think we could learn a thing or two from the people that live on this small island. On day seven, we packed up our things and played one last round of soccer with the Codrington kids before heading to our new home at the University of the West Indies. After barely getting settled at UV, we headed to the Mount Gay tasting room for an excellent presentation about Mount Gay history and an even better rum tasting. Good. Good. We had something to eat before we came here to yes. drink rum. Yes. And everyone yes. in this corner is over the age of 18, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, much older. <laughs> <laughs> the others look to Ross and say, you're just speaking for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> now, let's welcome all of you to the beautiful island of Barbados and welcome to Mount Gay, the birthplace of rum. I'm Tina, and I will be your host on a, a fairly intoxicated. But a very formative experience, you're not concerned, are you okay? 
it's gonna be a little bit. We were stumbled upon accidentally by the Portuguese. And in doing so, they were greeted with massive trees along our coastline carrying aerial roots. The way the roots were clustered together and hanging down reminded them of the bears of men. They gave us the name Los Barbados for the bearded ones. They couldn't find out what of those they left to get. The name of our stuck with us. The British arrived in 1625, it was translated then to the island of Barbados. But they left not returning until 1627, settling near the island. Ten years later, sugarcane was reintroduced and it flourished. Every spare piece of land you had, you now grew that grass. And it grows sugarcane, the only thing you want is of course money and sugar. But as you process sugar, you had all this thick, gooey mess made for tough called molasses, and you were not too fond of it. The more sugar they made, the more molasses they now had on their hands and they began to dump it at sea, that's the reason. They began to dump it at sea, but the browns fell. They left it laying ditches on the estates, they threw deep into their wells. Until it was discovered by accident, that the rain fell on that molasses by losing it. And in all the east, we have all around us on the island began to attack it, it fermented. And as it fermented, they consumed it. And as they consumed it, they had a bit too much fun while working out, you know, mm -hmm. at the distillery. A bit too much fun there. That led to the discovery of rock. Today we're going to use those same three things to make our product. We use water, molasses, and yeast. We've never added or taken anything away. Our morning plans for day eight got canceled, so we spent the morning at the beach. When we arrived at the beach, a few of us found a path into the abandoned Four Seasons Resort and looked around. It couldn't have been far from being complete, and it was baffling to me that it was just left there to become an eyesore in the middle of Paradise Beach. After our relaxing morning at the beach, we traveled to the Gun Hill Signal Station, where we enjoyed another delicious meal and learned that the cannons could shoot the whole way to the ocean. After our meal, we took time to reflect on many of the things that we had observed over the last several days. On day nine, we met Jackie, the agricultural manager at Mount Gates Oxford Estates. In the next few clips, she talks about the impact of climate change on their sugarcane production and their mitigation efforts. One challenge that we're facing here right now is, well, due to climate change, the rainfall patterns are no longer predictable. The rainfall was already short, right? But it was also very sporadic and when it did come it was like a rainfall event and by that I mean it was extremely heavy there was flooding there was no percolation into the earth it would just go across the topsoil take the topsoil with it so there was soil erosion and obviously what that means is that we're using, losing our precious organic matter and all of the good work that you're putting in is lost because of the heavy rainfall soil erosion so what we've been doing to combat that is planting this grass called the fish grass and as we rely heavily on rainfall what we have also done is develop a pond in the center of the estate because we're trying to collect what rainfall we can so that in the upcoming dry season which is to start now um, we will have a source of water even in the rainfall stock. After learning about the different varieties of sugar cane grown on the island we were able to grind the cane stalks and taste the juice from four different varieties. The difference in taste, color, and texture between an older variety that was planted and harvested by hand and a younger variety that is planted and harvested by machines was very notable. Next, we headed to the Mount Gay Distillery, where we got a full tour of all the parts of the distillery, from the well to the column and pot stills. They even had three fermentation barrels running, so we got to see and smell the fermentation process. It smelled oddly like apples. After taking in a ton of information about Mount Gay's operation, we had lunch at Fisherman's Pub and then headed to the 3W's Oval at Yui to learn about sports in Barbados.
On our free day, we decided to go on a catamaran cruise, including special surprise guest Dr. Muth, Dr. Tootin, and Coach Radio. The day was full of snorkeling, giggling, maybe just a few drinks, and the experiences and memories were worth every penny spent. On day 11, we met with Tony one last time before visiting Foursquare. Okay, A-S-A-N-T-E, Ashanti, A-S-A-N-T-E. The S is sometimes S-H. It's carved from mahogany. Do you remember the mahogany that we worked with? And painted black. And the, that rough bark that you've seen in the mahogany tree was on the back of it representing the scars of the slave. Now this is the story of a real person. After saying goodbye to Tony and enjoying one last fish cutter, we made our way to the final rum distillery of the trip. Forsberg's experience was much less structured than Mount Gay's, but much more unique in that it's not something they routinely do, but instead was something they did just for us. All week, Dr. Muth and Tootin raved and ranted about how good Foursquare rum was, and we all thought they were being a bit dramatic, but we were sorely mistaken. The coolest parts about our Foursquare visit were getting to meet the Gale Seal, getting a whole free bottle of rum, and the tasting after the tour was over. There's one important part of the trip that I haven't yet mentioned, David. David was our bus driver every day, everywhere. If we were going somewhere, David went with us. During our short two weeks, we all grew to adore David, and I think he liked us too. He was always looking out for us, making sure we didn't do anything unsafe or get in any trouble, and always making sure we arrived at our destination safely. His heart and kindness were unmatched, and I fully believe that it wouldn't have been the same without him. On day 12, we woke up at 4 a.m., packed our bags, and headed to the airport with full luggage and heavy hearts. We left Barbados with bittersweet emotions, eager to get back home to our families and friends, but not quite ready to leave this little island that we'd grown to love. I think that this trip will stick with us for a very long time. 